and I'm just going to make sure this actually appears to be live. Uh, and then I'm mostly going to ignore this Twitch channel henceforth because I don't really know how to do kind of like a live trapeze act of thinking and figuring things out while uh, people are talking at me. Okay, this seems to uh, this seems to be working. Great. Good morning. Hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, I'm now mostly going to pretend that you don't exist, uh, except that I'm going to kind of talk aloud and explain uh, what I'm doing. I'm going to narrate a little more than I otherwise would in my work, uh, just to kick things off. <clears throat> uh, for this louder part of my writing session this morning, I want to think about these books, Design Unbound, uh, these books by uh, Anne Pendleton Julian and John Seely Brown. And Pendleton Julian is a architect at MIT, but just more generally is uh, a designer and uh, has a lot to say about design. John Seely Brown was the chief scientist at Xerox Park and uh, has kind of a, a legendary history and, in the creation of various personal computing technologies. And these books have some very unusual ideas about design. I find them quite profound in, in a number of ways, uh, and yet there are some tensions with my views on design or my mm, hunches about design. And I want to try to understand those tensions. And I think I'm going to try to write to the authors, but in order to write to the authors, I need to understand the work a lot better. So this is me trying to understand the work better and uh, trying to understand how it relates to my own ideas about design, and in particular to try to articulate <clears throat> tensions, contradictions I see, uh, just questions even. And, all right, Bash is asking for my permission to access some accessibility features here. Made a change to a script right before this call. Probably not the best idea. Hopefully everything doesn't burn down. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Just making sure things seem to be functioning here. They do seem to be functioning here. All right. Good, I guess. Let's get going. So I tend to begin <clears throat> with uh, a note that's centered on uh, the day. This is this is an ephemeral note. This is something that gets thrown away, basically never consulted again, um, but it's sort of a staging area. So some of the, the key things that, that are uh, sources of conflict for me uh, are the ideas that I've been developing with Michael Nielsen are around this theory of insight through making. And there, there's kind of a, a, a core parable that we tell about insight through making, which is that the invention of the Hindu Arabic numeral system required a work of mathematical genius simultaneously with a work of design genius. Now, that's intention and sort of an agreement with a number of themes in these books, Design and Bound. And I don't really understand the places of tension and agreement at the moment. All I can really perceive is just a textured relationship with places of overlap and places of disjoint uh, relation. So I need to understand them better. Design Unbound claims some things relative to this. First, maybe most relevantly and shallowly, there's uh, various claims in the traditional design practice sense, uh, and I'll say like human-centered design practice sense, around like collaborative participatory design, um, reframed uh, using a, a term of art or a coinage uh, systems of action. And systems of action don't just comprise like uh, things which are designed, which are designed collaboratively or 
in a participatory fashion, uh, but that's an element of systems of action. So I'm pretty sure that uh, systems of action is going to be one of the pages that I write. <clears throat> uh, so we can, we can start there. Um, I don't really know. I don't know that I'm going to start there. Um, instead, I'm just going to bring it up a little more. Um, and for a coinage like this, that's just really vague, or, or vague isn't the right word, it's very general. Um, I usually title the note something like, um, something like this to kind of scope it. <clears throat> All right. So besides systems of action, another key piece that's in tension here is the author's own claims about the importance of essentially like authorial um, leadership. Hmm. In particular, there's a claim that uh, designers must act uh, as both leaders and facilitators. And there's some very specific text that I will kind of excerpt and distill that explains how Yeah, while collaboration is an exalted activity, uh, most truly great works are the result of one person. Either acting alone in their studio or as creative leaders capable of transferring their vision to others. Uh, a bunch of examples listed, Redon, Calder, Eisenstein, Kurosawa, Wagner, etc. And those great works have come from one creative mind. This resonates. Um, and yet it's in tension, right? Uh, it's in really essential tension. They use even a better word than leader here. They use the word orchestrators. Great work does seem to basically always come from one mind or sometimes like a hive mind, uh, a duo. And yet that duo must be in contact with, be working in, working on uh, this broader environment. So that accesses some of the central themes of this book. Um, they're all kind of entangled, but um, the book returns again and again to this phrase, in a white water world, doing X in a white world, water world, designing, thinking, creating, et cetera, in a white water world. Um, what's meant by that is that uh, we live in a world in which the contexts for which we are designing, uh, they're constantly evolving. Um, there is no like fixed list of design requirements ever. Uh, this accesses the expanding the brief coinage um, from the book, which uh, kind of relates to the traditional or, or more jovial uh, design saying of, um, rip the brief, though it's, it's much more serious in this context and it, it means something much more specific. Yeah, in a whitewater world, there's no fixed list of design requirements. Rather, um, uh, in a sailboat, you can um, set, um, set off towards the horizon, uh, tack with the winds, but always keep your objective in scope. Um, but when whitewater rafting, you really need to mm, dance with the river, uh, use your paddles both to steer and also to feel uh, the, the weight uh, and the movement of the water. Uh, there's no fixed destination possible. You're riding with the current um, yet you are the current. Um, so I, I'll unpack this in a whitewater world thing into its own notes as well. Uh, it's very important to the central themes here. And it's also important to these claims about insight you're making, um, but in kind of a peripheral way. Um, there's also this really central related theme 
about uh, designing in and on a context. And what's meant by that is that when you're designing, you are designing within a context, um, i.e. You're, you're maybe making an object or creating a system um, which acts on the objects uh, and the parameters of that context. Um, and yet when you do that, almost inevitably, if you're doing anything interesting, you're also acting on the context in which you reside, um, changing its parameters, changing its goals, um, changing the core nouns and verbs to use a, a phrase from my work with Michael. So the tension here, ah, and, and there's, there's one other core piece that I'm going to need to draw on, which is, uh, well, I guess it gets back to the authorial versus, um, yeah, this works. Okay, so there's, there's a specific story uh, or series of stories, really, um, which are Roughly the normal kinds of stories you see in high-level design portfolios. Uh, we co-created a solution with 300 domain experts, um, you know, with, within research libraries is one example, and within uh, the design of a, uh, a university for women in Southeast Asia is another. And the, the tension here is that uh, the designers are not experts on libraries. Uh, so they're able to distill the needs, observations, et cetera, of the experts. And they're also able to facilitate um, the experts like expressing and thinking more creatively than they otherwise would. Um, and they're also able to do a bunch of uh, synthetic and even some abductive thinking themselves. Uh, and here's, here's where I think the core tension is that seems not sufficiently acknowledged in this book and kind of accesses the, the core claims that Michael and I make with insight through making in the Hindu Arabic numerals parable. Um, and that's that, the, so the designers are able to do a bunch of synthetic, not adductive, but abductive thinking themselves. Uh, but this activity is ultimately limited by the designer's understanding of the domain, isn't it? This, this is the tension that this, this gets to the, the jab at IDEO in the um, Hindu Arabic numerals parable. So the designers might be good synthesists, but they don't really understand the domain they're synthesizing. They have a couple of months exposure to it. So is it possible, and all of this just, it sits in conflict with this claim about leadership. You know, the people cited here are Dante, Cervantes, Joyce, Bach, Wagner, Cage, Borromini, Geary, Miro, Calder, Eisenstein, etc. Not in all cases. And it's interesting that like Corbusier, for instance, maybe not a domain expert in all the systems he's designing for. And maybe that's actually why maybe that explains some of his failures. But these others are both 
they play both the role of the synthesis and the domain expert. So like Bach, Wagner, certainly Miro, boy, um, Radana, Kurosawa. They're both the experts in the design-wise synthesis and also in the domain of inquiry, whatever it might be. You know, artistic expression in Bach's case, I mean, he's a, he's a spiritual leader. He devotes his life to uh, studying spiritual music and spiritual texts, and that's what he's expressing through his music. It's an interesting contrast with uh, Corbusier in particular. Uh, is somewhat uh, notorious for not understanding um, the object level domain issues that he's designing around. But anyway, all of this is in serious tension with these IDEO ish stories about synthesizing and distilling domain knowledge from you know, university research administrators. The university research administrators know a bunch of things about the needs of libraries, but um, they mostly lack, say, the, um, the structured creative skills that the designers have, as, as well as the, the skills of system design that the designers have, at least to some degree. Uh, and the designers have those skills, but um, they don't deeply understand libraries. and. I don't know how you get Wagner or Moreau out of that. And in particular, I don't know how you get Hindu Arabic numerals out of that. So I think that's the core tension. And maybe now I can articulate that and we can get to, um, to the meat of this process after 15 minutes of kind of organizing thoughts. I think that's the core tension. Um, this book argues that Creating systems of action, which is a term of art, um, but you can also just interpret it in its like colloquial vernacular uh, denotation. Creating systems of action requires um, experts in, actually they even make this case themselves. Um, yeah, uh, reading context deeply and generating highly amplified understandings of contexts. That is a core designer skill. That's, I think any serious design people would agree with that. That's, that's not really a contentious claim from this book. So we could look at that as, as kind of just a core activity of designers. Um, and yet um, those people are rarely um, the people uh, who are uh, contending with the system to be designed on a daily basis uh, and who have deep expertise uh, in the domain uh, of design. E.g. they're not uh, university library uh, administrators. Uh, the best work seems to come from, like, come ultimately from one person. That one person might be synthesizing a bunch of other people, and of course, they're they're extremely dependent on the context in which they're working. Um, but the work ultimately comes usually from one person, or sometimes a dyad, um, like. Um, the aims. Uh, in all the examples given, and in all the examples I can think of, that person is a profound domain expert, as well as a meta level expert, whatever that means. So, you know, if, if they're if they're Miro or, or Redon or whatever, 
Like he's a profound expert of human physiology, uh, and yet also an expert at these meta level skills of seeing the skill of an artist. So, um, aren't these <laughs> observations incompatible? Where, how do we get uh, Wagner level work on university library system design? I, I guess that's the core of the question. Normally at this point, I would take a break because I've been at my computer for 40 minutes, but I'm just gonna chug on through for the purposes of this live, th live stream. We'll see how that goes. All right. So I, I think I have my hands around um, a first draft of this core tension enough to start developing the main ideas. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Um, first thing I find myself wanting to do is to create a note just uh, for the book. Um, um, usually I do kind of a reverse naming. Uh, this is what I would call a literature note. This is not gonna be a, a note that really stands on its own. It's not evergreen. Instead, it's just gonna be kind of a jumping off point. Um, I would like to have bibliography. It's really a book series. Um, I'm using Zotero here. This is a book of two volumes. It's a little unusual. Um, and it was published in Boston by MIT Press in um, relatively recently. Okay. What are you doing, Zotero? Come on. All right, that will do for now. That'll do for now, okay. All right, so I think I'll begin by trying to articulate systems of action as they express in this book. Um, I don't really like this style of note, the, the coinage after someone else. And part of why I don't like it is that it means that I'm still thinking in terms of this other person's systems and frameworks rather than kind of essentially in terms of my own. It's like I haven't fully digested it. Uh, but some terms like uh, deliberate practice or whatever, like they're, they kind of transcend the book. I'm not really sure if systems of action transcends this book yet. So we're going to start here with a kind of a coinage oriented note. Um, and we're going to see we're gonna see whether we can process this into something that isn't kind of dependent on the authors. Um, all right. First, just a, a high level summary of the book, Design and Bound. Um,
this is kind of a poor high level summary, but um, it helps me ground my thinking about the book. And it's also like, it generates a little bit of feedback about how well I feel I understand this, I don't know, 900 pages from a high level. All right, systems of action. Let's talk about systems of action. This book, by the way, the reason I originally picked it up was that uh, it has just an incredible table of contents. I know that's a really shallow reason to pick up a book, but uh, it's it's really amazing. And uh, I think it, I think it was David Chapman who originally uh, showed this to me. And I think it was when I was talking about peripheral vision. And I kind of thought, you know, any book that uh, any book that has a table of contents that looks like this has to be pretty interesting. And then I saw that um, John Sidley Brown was um, one of the authors, and I thought, well, okay, I'm definitely gonna read this now. It's interesting because I, I wasn't uh, wasn't familiar with Anne Pendleton Julian. Um, the book actually seems to be mostly written in her voice uh, rather than John's, and um, she has a lot of really profound things to say. It's clearly. A very, very interesting practice. All right. I'm slowly navigating to systems of action. Hmm. Okay. And I'm trying to put this in my own words. I'm trying like not to copy what the book has to say. Let's see how that matches up with their definition. A system of action is a coherent collection of interrelated components that affect the way people do things. Okay. Uh, it's transformative in intent, affecting both explicit behaviors and embedded habits. Systems of action scale, enabling small actions to affect a large social ecosystem through work they do inside the system. All right, so there's a few important elements there that I missed. Um, again, trying to paraphrase without looking at the book, systems of action are constructed um, to allow participants to um, affect substantial change through small actions, and indeed don't necessarily require the participation of uh, all um, inhabitants to generate that change. That's pretty good. Coherent collection of interrelated components is an interesting phrase. It's very vague. So is this. I think we're just going to have to drill down. I will use that for now, although I don't really understand what it means, so I'm going to put it in quotes. That delimits the fact that this is not my voice. I don't really understand this quote. <clears throat> Why am I writing this note? I'm writing this note because uh, of this core tension. Yeah, and what I really want to access is um, uh, hmm.
I'll articulate some of the, the key components of the system of action. Um, I'm going to begin by transcribing the list from the book, or at least a paraphrased version of the list from the book, and then I'm going to try to unpack each of these myself. Um, Um, that's fine, actually. All right. This vehicle notion is, is, I think, really entangled to the authors and particularly Pendleton Julian's work as a studio designer. Like the nature of her work is that she takes on engagements with, you know, a research library or whatever. So she needs a vehicle. Vehicle is an opportunity, uh, a contract with a research library um, redesign plan, um, a brief around the construction of a university. Really, a, this is sufficient. Um, concept. The concept grounds the vision and the action. Oh, sorry, in, in the vehicle. Um, it's more concrete, it's more specific. Um, it doesn't uh, fall to the level of specific mechanisms, but it um, describes how the vision is going to be achieved by the vehicle. The mechanisms are um, specific system nouns and verbs. Again, not really using her phrasing. Um, so this might be um, in, a, um, in a physical environment. This might um, represent physical spaces or affordances. Um, in a social environment, this might capture uh, rituals or practices. Yeah, I think I've mostly captured what's being described here. These are a coherent set. Um, strategically chosen to balance and uh, 
amplify each other. Um, the system of action operates in, a, in an ever-changing context. That context uh, uh, level of the individual, uh, small groups, communities, and uh, the larger society in which that uh, design is embedded, the relationships um, um, interact completely with Not a great first crack, but it'll do. So this is what we're what we're designing when we're designing a system of action like a, a new library system. Um, and here again, I'm just going to transcribe these necessary practices and components, and then think about them a bit more. Amplified reading of context, I think, is going to be the most important one for us. This is a very designerly competency. Shaping and working in extremely multidisciplinary spaces. I think this is mostly necessary because um, the authors and their peers are consultants. Now, if it were really the case that the library administrators had the core competencies to pull this off for themselves, like they would still have to be somewhat multidisciplinary because uh, there are many disciplines involved in libraries, but they wouldn't need to be these like hubs that designers do. Meta designing. I don't think I even recall what that is. I think it's only discussed in a footnote. Um, okay, and this is going to be the other one embracing the role of the designer as both leader and orchestrator. This is going to be the other key thing. shaping critical and effective networks of partners. All right. I don't actually understand what meta-designing is, so let me... I think it's just in a footnote. Maybe it's not even in a footnote. Maybe that's why I didn't... Uh... Yeah. Oh, no, no, the whole, the whole chapter is, okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, all right, so meta designing is um, about designing the design processes. Um, again, maybe only, only so important because the authors are consultants. Um, I am, I think meta designing is a, this may represent, and by the way, this, this note lives in my inbox because this note is not yet um, evergreen, hashtag E for evergreen. Mm, it's got these like crappy highlighted bits and th this note can't stand on its own. So, um, yeah. Okay. This meta designing, it's something you need, uh, if you have to, um, Meta designing is important to the traditional studio design process because the studio designers are outside the context of use and they have to create some way to bring the people who are inside of the context of use uh, together with their design process. But like, wouldn't it be nice if that weren't so necessary? 
just gonna make sure everything's still working with the stream. Seems to be. All right. Good. We're just hoping that stays that way. Um. All right. So I think these two highlighted guys are going to be the key ideas. Uh, and here again, embracing the role of the designer as leader and orchestrator. This probably wants to be its own note. Um, I'm not going to frame it in their terms. So it may be several notes. I don't really know what they are yet. Um, this relates to the observation about um, truly great works and being the result of one person. But first, let me try to articulate uh, the author's claims here. Um, the designer's role is both to um, distill the many ideas and observations from the charrettes, the converse, oh gosh, that's a word, the conversations with disciplinary experts, etc., and also to um, turn that into a vision of their own. And this is really the core of the issue, I think. Let me just bring in some pulls from the book. So I'm not totally sure what I want to do here. And usually my response to this is to ask, what can I say? Um, what is a simple thing that I can say that seems to work or seems to be true? Why were there two? Do we have a sync conflict or something? Yep. I right, got it. I think I'm gonna bounce over to insight through making. I'm spending too much time in others' words. I wanna ground myself a little more in my own. Yeah, action through making is a core idea of this book as well. This note is really saying several things at once. It's making a claim about um, work needing to be situated in the context of action, uh, this kind of dynamic dance. And there's a distinction uh, that I'm going to have to develop because it's interesting between our theory here and what's articulated in this book, namely that um, this theory suggests that what's happening when you are making things and thinking hard about what you're making and using them to get new ideas is that you're, you're making a thing and putting it out in the world and using it to see the world better. 
And the authors of Design and Bound would suggest that, yes, that's true. And in addition to that, you are also changing the world uh, by putting that thing out there. And the world is just constantly changing. So uh, this is a loop that's necessary, not only in order to correctly see what you are making, um, but it's just necessary in general in a so-called whitewater world. And the second claim is really the central one to my current confusion, uh, which is just that, um, yeah, Hindu Arabic numerals would not come out of a design consultancy. I think I'm going to unpack that a little bit. I'm going to refactor this note a little bit. This is starting to access the conflict a little more sharply. And I noticed that I'm, I'm actually writing this differently than we had in TTFT. I'm bringing more design process into it uh, to try to make it stand up better against uh, what Design Unbound has to say. I'm actually, uh, in some sense, I'm like steel manning this. It's not quite true. It's partially true. But in particular, bringing them into the design process was not something we discussed in TTFT. The thing is that it just, it still wouldn't work, I think.
the core problem is that it's a good way to start a, a paragraph if you want to see if you actually know what you're talking about. Um, All right. Now for the so what. You know, the so what is something like, um, a little too sharp. I'm just not quite right. I'm not quite sure what I think here. This phrase insight you're making it's interesting. It's it's kind of the coinage has drifted. I'm trying to bring it over here.
Yeah, this phrase is very important. You know, there's a separate claim here that I'm not quite making. Really. Yeah. I'm unhappy with this note system right now. It's too coarsely factored. It's not sufficiently atomic. Insight through making is making too many claims at once. Um, Trying to figure out how to factor this a little better so that I can access the part that is most relevant to this confusion about design and bound. It's very difficult to separate the parable of the um, Hindu Arabic numerals from these core claims about insight through making. I guess the issue is that uh, the claims are very abstract and they need to be concretized through example, through a specific situation.
So I'm finding myself wanting to refactor this this note into a lot of notes right now. And I'm also asking myself, is that, is that really what I want to do right now with this writing session? Uh, I think it's probably not. So I'm trying to figure out what my next step is. Step back to what I was doing over here. I don't like this note. It's just not saying very much. It's very vague and design schooly. Honestly, anything this abstract is kind of necessarily that way. I'm not sure I'm going to keep this note. This is not a great... Uh, unpack these claims at least a little bit. Maybe I won't refactor the whole page yet, but I'm going to put it back into my inbox because it just needs a lot more work. Oh, what a ridiculous sentence this is. <clears throat> I think it's clearly <laughs> it's it's clearly demonstrative of the fact that I don't really understand this. Uh, that's okay for now, I think. 
what I'm really trying to say here. I think I'm trying to say these core insight through, like basically I'm trying to make this insight through making claim. Which seems to align with this claim. And maybe aligns with this claim. I mean, I think this is again a very consultancy heavy claim. Yeah, and where's, where's the tension? Where's the incompatibility? question it's like Yeah, this, this phrase underlying subject matters, one Michael and I really wrestled with, I don't, it's very big. I'm a little lost, so I'm going to try to just articulate some questions, some finer grain things I think I know. Uh, to what extent can a professional designer operating a studio practice? create systems which express profound subject matter insight. If this is, is indeed impossible, then where can such systems come from? Do they require training the subject matter experts in system design?
think I'm going to try moving laterally a little bit and see if I can unpack this claim, which does not seem tied to the book. So it has a shot of actually being evergreen. I have a bunch of comments about arterialism. I'll dig through those. None of them actually really seem very relevant here. That's interesting. I'm very surprised that word auteur doesn't appear anywhere in my notes. Hmm. All right. So let's see. I'm trying to write an evergreen note that claims um, Great work is really the result product of a single person. This is just a core claim about authorship. Yeah. Maybe this maybe this isn't always true. I mean it certainly isn't. Where do I want to go with this? Invention's interesting. Lots of fun examples. But um, often it's more textured and complex with invention. So I'm not quite sure I want to include invention. fun to ask why this might be. 
might be And there's some relationships here to some prior notes I've written um, that I will try to find. Hmm. All right, that's nice. Now this is actually linked into things. All right, we got one real evergreen node out of this whole thing. That's good. And now I, I feel comfortable, now that I've framed this in my own thinking, I feel reasonably comfortable adding the, um, the verbatims from this book, which give it some more texture. Uh, get the actual page number. Okay, this is kind of a decent note now. That's good. A tag here um, in my inbox called study that I use for um, notes that are representing kind of books and things I'm reading and studying. I distinguish these from things in my inbox that are more ideas that I'm trying to explore and flesh out. 
because I use different times to do those things. I tend not to use my mornings to like write notes about books. Um, it's kind of a lower effort activity. I, I try to use the mornings to develop uh, ideas that I've been working on. And uh, the reason why I'm working on this this morning is that uh, I'm not I'm not really writing notes about this book. Um, I'm noticing a tension between some core claims of this book and um, some ideas that I've been developing, and I'm trying to understand those tensions. Um, and you can see by kind of the, the speed at which I'm making progress here uh, and the degree of confusion. Um, this is the kind of, uh, kind of work I prefer doing in the morning. If all I'm trying to do is just like take notes on the book, um, that's a much less confusing process, but it's also a much less productive process. All right, so where are we landing? We're, we're uh, about 90 minutes in. I'm gonna need to take a break here in a minute. So I'll probably turn off the live stream. Let's see if we can land in a place that actually uh, has some finality now that I, I'll kind of return to this core tension for you know one last time. Um, where are we at? Try one one more time anew. All right. So inventing truly powerful um, new systems seems to require both systems design expertise and also subject matter expertise. Let's see insight through making and the invention. I've got some sync conflicts, I guess. I think the uh, live streaming process is really slowing down my computer and creating some interesting issues. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. So it seems to require these things. Uh, the traditional design really approach also um, advocated in Design Unbound um, is to uh, have the designer act as orchestrator uh, in addition to synthesis and visionary. Uh, but Um, great creative work is usually the product of a single person. The designer is not a domain expert. Um, well, okay. Uh, in the processes, in okay, so in typical design processes because the designer acts as the um, catalyst and synthesize uh, producing the distilled creative vision from uh, everyone's contributions. This 
this is a little incoherent. means right Okay, I think that's the core of it. I'm actually reasonably happy with this summary. Is this evergreen? Is there a name I can give to this? That would be a nice bow to put on all of this. Maybe there kind of is. Um, let's give it a shot. This systems of action node, I, I'm probably just gonna ditch this node. I think the name I can give to this is something like uh, typical design practices. Can't uh, traditional design practices. can't produce systems which require profound subject matter insight. That's not a terrible title. One thing that makes me uncomfortable here is I'm not... This isn't yet enormously different from what Michael and I have articulated in TTFT. Um, I haven't incorporated enough of Design Unbound into this, uh, but this I think is the, the key differentiator in this too. Uh, hey, Shabu. I thought he was coming to say hi. All right. I'm going to do one more pass on this. It's still not quite sharp, and I need to link to it from a few places in order to kind of weave it into what I'm doing here. I'm gonna 
bring in um, what am I doing here? Also, I'm going to bring in this piece. There's, there's elements of this that I'm not really incorporating in here yet, which probably should be incorporated. All right, this is, I think, going to be the other place where I'll bring in ideas from this book. I was just saying how I didn't like this note. Where did it go? There we go. All right, this sentence is quite confused now. Uh, syntactically, but it's sharper in terms of understanding and concept. Mm -hmm. Oh, I dropped the page number.
Okay. I'm actually reasonably happy with that. Um, at least as a first start. So I think I will end there. Uh, that might be enough for me to write an email. We'll see. Uh, that was an interesting experiment with the uh, screencasting. I don't really know how well it worked. I probably chose too difficult a writing session to really demonstrate anything terribly interesting. Um, other than hearing me be confused for an hour and a half, but um, yeah, got to experiment to uh, to get anywhere. So there we go. Have a good day, y'all.